Okay, it's going to be my <clears throat> pleasure to preside over our prize ceremony this afternoon. We are presenting three distinguished awards, and the first will be the Patrick Sufis Prize, which was established and funded in 2006 by Patrick Sufis, a member of the Society for 22 years until his death in 2014. The Patrick Sufis Prize honors accomplishments in three very different and deeply significant scholarly fields that reflect the spectacular scope of his own interests. The prize rotates, rotates each year between philosophy, psychology, and the history of science. Rich Schifrin, head of the selection committee, will present this year's award. Thank you, Linda. Okay, the recipient of the 2023 Patrick Soupies Prize for a body of outstanding work in mathematical or experimental psychology is Elkie Weber. In recognition of her research showing how people make decisions important for society using creative experiments and mathematically precise models and theory. Elka Weber is one of the world's most respected decision scientists. Her research is marked by her desire to help society by helping people make wise decisions in real world settings. Traditional economic theories of decision making were based on uh, rational principles, uh, principles that humans routinely violate in both the laboratory and the world. Dr. Weber has shown how such irrationality arises from limited human cognition faced with an unpredictable world, a world that provides feedback erratically, a world that provides feedback often at long delays. Her research has utilized principles of discounting of risk and time to show both in the laboratory and in the world how humans make decisions in their real environment. Further, she has shown how the social network in which humans are embedded, particularly the important role of social norms and uh, violations of social norms, play a critical role in their decision making. Her research has thus been applied to energy policy and climate change. Her most recent research has helped individuals and social planners design decision environments that recognize the limitations of decision makers but nonetheless capitalize on the full range of human capabilities and goals to help them make wise decisions. Elka Weber is now at Princeton, where her research spans decision-making in psychology, behavioral science, energy, environmental policy, and issues, and in business. Dr. Weber's research aligns perfectly with the mission of the American Philosophical Society promoting useful knowledge. On behalf of the Soupies Prize Committee, it is my great pleasure to present the Patrick Soupies Prize for pioneering, pioneering work in mathematical or experimental psychology to Elke Weber. I sincerely thank the society for this great honor. My, my one regret is that my PhD advisor and mentor, Duncan Luce, can't be here today. He's no longer with us. He, of course, was the first recipient of the Patrick Soupies Prize for Psychology in, in 2012. Uh, I never met Pat Soupies, unfortunately, uh, but got to know him through his epochal work, you know, the three-volume Foundations of Measurement, uh, that was uh, published in 1971 by uh, Krantz, Luce, uh, Supis, and Tversky. I had the good fortune of working with Dave Krantz uh, later at Columbia, where we co-founded and uh, co-directed the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. Uh, for my dissertation, I devised an axiomatic model of risk perception. 
uh, that showed that, and we showed that investors' perceptions of financial instruments, you know, the risk of those actually was much better captured by that model than by uh, the, the variance of returns, for example. Uh, and then when I expanded uh, that work to uh, natural and societal hazards, I realized that psychological risk dimensions like dread or the uh, perceived loss of control also influenced uh, decisions very fundamentally and perceptions, uh, and leading to my risk as feelings framework. Uh, I spend a lot of time and energy, as, as uh, you already mentioned, uh, disseminating a better appreciation of the full range of human decision processes to policy bodies like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and you know, the ruling assumption there, of course, is one of rational choice, which, as we know, is, is not always warranted. And so better understanding the full range of psychological decision processes, uh, consumers, voters, uh, investors, uh, the technology uh, adopters you know, making decisions, yes, by calculations, but also by recourse to feelings uh, and to either tribal or professional rules of conduct really helps us design decision environments you know, that help increase well-being uh, and justice and sustainability. So again, I, I thank the society for endorsing those activities and efforts of mine. Thank you very much. Established in 1888, the Henry M. Phillips Prize in Jurisprudence is awarded in recognition of outstanding lifetime contributions to the field of jurisprudence and important publications which illustrate that accomplishment. In the 125 years since its inception, the Society has bestowed this prize only 27 times. This year, the prize is awarded to Catherine McKinnon. The citation reads, quote, in recognition of her intellectual and political leadership in international law, constitutional law, political and legal theory, and jurisprudence, and in particular, her pioneering work on gender equality, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation, including sexual harassment, rape, prostitution, sex trafficking, and pornography, and her effective framing of such harms as civil rights violations in the United States and other countries, and in international law, bringing recognition and transformation in theory and practice." Unquote. Her pioneering book, published in 1979, Sexual Harassment of Working Women, A Case of Sex Discrimination, created the legal claim for sexual harassment as a form of discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other prohibitions of sex discrimination with enduring consequences for workplaces. She frames sexual harassment as sexual discrimination in education under Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, which transformed practices and procedures in schools, colleges, and universities. She also worked to change legal treatment of pornography, crafted litigation and legislative strategies to treat legal claims of rape as genocidal acts, and brought the perspective of sex inequality and sexual violence to prostitution and sex trafficking. Her thorough attention to power relationships draws on and contributes to epistemology, political theory, legal theory, and political and legal practices with significant influences on laws, institutions, and on the lives of many. Catherine Kitty McKinnon is the Elizabeth A. Long Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School and the long-term long James Barr Ames Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. It's my great pleasure to present the Henry M. Phillips Prize in Jurisprudence in recognition of outstanding lifetime contributions to Catherine McKinnon. This is astounding. Um, 
thank you to the committee and to this society for this honor of a lifetime. It is especially meaningful to me to be honored in the memory of Henry M. Phillips, who practiced law for a living. I am grateful for your understanding that a vision of equality critical of the realities of the dominance of men and the subordination of women is philosophy. Thank you for knowing that practicing law for change in the real world for survivors of sexual violation counts as jurisprudence. And thank you for lifting up someone whose method is to listen to people designated to be silenced and to act on what they say. Someone made controversial who acts on seeing and saying what power doesn't want seen and said. Thank you especially for seeing through all the lies about my work. And thank you to all my angels out there, which is why I'm able to be here. I hope that giving this prize to me inspires young people to choose meaningful work over the lures of conventional career success and encourages them to take real risks to their self-interest and not be corrupted by dangled success. And I hope that many more women, non-binary people, trans people, and people of color will be given this high honor and this award in the years to come. Thank you. In 1906, the U.S. Congress authorized the Benjamin Franklin Medal to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Franklin's birth. For three decades, only one was given, and that was to Marie Curie in 1921. Since 1937, the award has been given more liberally, but still quite selectively for major contributions in the sciences, humanities, or public service. The Benjamin Franklin Medal for Distinguished Achievement in Science is the highest honor bestowed by the American Philosophical Society. Ron Fairman, chair of the selection committee, will present this year's medal. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Linda. I would also like to acknowledge the other members of the selection committee, in addition to myself, Clyde Barker, Larry Einhorn and John Loeb. Um, and John, if you're somewhere near, try to make your way toward the front so we can all get a picture with Martine. The recipient of the 2023 Benjamin Franklin Medal for Distinguished Achievement in Science is Martine Rothblatt, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of United Therapeutics. Prior to creating United Therapeutics, Dr. Rothblatt founded and served as chair and chief executive officer of Sirius Satellite Radio and was principally responsible for several other unique applications of satellite communications technology. She also represented the radio astronomy interests of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Radio Frequencies before the Federal Communications Commission. <clears throat> On behalf of the International Bar Association, she led efforts to present the United Nations with a draft human genome treaty. She moved to biotechnology from satellite technology and started United Therapeutics in 1996 to find a cure or better treatment for primary pulmonary hypertension that affects one of her daughters, a disease that was deadly at the time. It sells five FDA-approved drugs to help people with the disease. Now publicly traded, the company is experimenting with pig cloning and genetic modifications to create transplants the body doesn't reject. The citation that Nora is holding over here, 
that accompanies the medal is inscribed, and I quote, in recognition of her many transformative, diverse, singular scientific and public service contributions, including, but not limited to, creating and patenting a system for providing global portable internet access using low earth orbit satellite and satellite direct radio broadcast system resulting in the successful commercialization of the first global satellite radio network, founding a biotechnology company that seeks to repair donated organs previously considered too damaged for transplant and thereby provide an unlimited supply of transplantable organs, advancing xenotransplantation through genetic engineering and digital modeling, creating organs that are directly transplantable into humans, revolutionizing the timely delivery of transplant organs through the development of a battery-powered helicopter, setting world records for electric flight while culminating in the drone delivery of donor organs for transplant, becoming a leading advocate for transgender rights, and investigating the future of artificial intelligence as a cognitive enabler with her work on digital consciousness and immortality, end quote. Acknowledging these profound contributions to humanity and her unique intellect to solve insurmountable challenges, the APS is proud to award Martine Rothblatt our highest honor, the Benjamin Franklin Medal for Distinguished Achievement in the Sciences. Wow, I am so humbled, um, heartened, grateful, filled with really disbelief that um, such a wonderful, amazing honor could be shared with me. And um, I just thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. I want to uh, first and foremost um, thank and recognize my partner, collaborator, soulmate, brainstorm, um, brainstormy, <laughs> brainstormer <laughs> for over 40 years, my partner being at Aspen Rothblatt. And <laughs> I also um, want to thank very much um, two individuals uh, who were instrumental in uh, guiding me to become a member of, a, of the American Philosophical Society. Barry Blumberg, our former president, who was one of my key mentors, and uh, Dr. Thomas Starzl, who it turns out was the previous recipient of this August award, uh, who was also um, a key mentor to me. So um, it's thanks to really, I think, Dr. Starzl and Dr. Blumberg that I'm here today um, floating on the air to, <laughs> to accept this award. I also uh, want to express uh, great appreciation to uh, Dr. Clyde Barker, former president of the American Philosophical Society, an outstanding transplant surgeon, and a pioneer in discovering the pathways to the immunotolerance that was described in, in the um, inscription uh, upon the award, Dr. Barker, thank you so much for, for being here and contributing all that you've contributed to this world and continuing to inspire me uh, to this very day. Um, I became a member in 2008, so this is actually the 15th anniversary. Um, just uh, 
uh, earlier this week of, of becoming a member and, and accepting the induction into the membership on this very stage from uh, Dr. Blumberg. It was an amazing, amazing moment. And about uh, five years after that, I was asked by the society to give the, um, the, uh, a special lecture um, in, on the topic of xenotransplantation. And um, I was humbled to have Dr. Barker and Dr. Starzl uh, in the audience, Dr. Starzl being certainly one of the key fathers of organ transplantation. And I described, um, you know, a, a concrete plan then to uh, be able to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs um, so that societies are not forced into these type of choices of who gets an organ and who doesn't, which as the, our um, first um, awardee pointed out, um, uh, Dr. Weber, humans don't really do very well with those type of choices. We're just not programmed to do well. So I thought if we could have an unlimited supply of automobile parts and housing parts and airplane parts, why not an un unlimited supply of uh, body parts? We started with the enormous number of organs that people very generously and kindly donate upon their demise, but which transplant surgeons feel are in such horrible condition um, of course, a, a dying body is not a friendly place for an organ that they wouldn't dare put that organ into another person's body who is close to their deathbed. And I'm very proud to announce uh, publicly um, from this uh, um, podium today that we have now saved over 300 people's lives with lungs that no transplant surgeon anywhere in the country wanted to use, but we were able to fly them, restore them, and then fly them back out again to be successfully transplanted. So that's not only beautiful for the, for the patients, for their families, for their loved ones, for the hospitals, it's also beautiful for the people who wish to give uh, the gift of life um, upon the end of their life. So I just share with you that, uh, that um, one, I think, very important milestone as a way of saying that this award, it it tops off my batteries. It fills me with an enthusiasm uh, to continue working ever harder each and every day uh, to create a better world for everyone, to be really as much the embodiment of the spirit and the, uh, and the facts of life of Benjamin Franklin that I possibly can be. Thank you so much. I thought I had been reprieved. <laughs> now it's a pleasure to give this little uh, little speech, which I'll try and shorten. Um, the Rhodes Medal has a history. It was the brainchild of Herman Goldstein, a former, very much beloved executive officer of this society. Um, who was a great friend of Dr. Rhodes, uh, also a Princeton uh, professor of mathematics and one of the, and a team member of the group that designed the first digital computer out at the University of Pennsylvania, ENIAC. And he was such a friend and such an admirer of Dr. Rhodes that he thought that there should be a gold medal designed and given in his honor, and that it should come from three societies that Dr. Rhodes had presided over, this being one, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, another, and the Department of Surgery, which Dr. Rhodes uh, headed for a long time to be the third. Um, it's easy to uh, talk about an hour for Dr. Rhodes but to try and paint a picture of this man uh, in a few words is impossible. Um, so I won't even try, but I will say a couple of things about him. It's hard to believe actually that he's not here uh, because he had been here and so important to this society for so many years. 
for example, this room, this building, is one of the things that he organized so that we have that rather than crowding into Philosophical Hall for all of our meetings. Um, it's uh, it's uh, hard to believe that he's been dead for 21 years. Uh, one of his well-studied poses was to go to a board meeting or a conference at a scientific meeting, and particularly in his later years, sitting in the front row, seemed to be asleep. And everyone thought he was asleep. And then after the others had spoken or made their arguments, he would start up as though he had been asleep and ask the, the pertinent question or give the solution to the problem that had been uh, explained and, and given up on. Um, he was never asleep. That was a well-studied pose on his part. Uh, and uh, <laughs> He carried it out, he carried it out uh, in a number of sites uh, with great effectiveness. Um, and uh, with regard to being surprised that he's not here, one wag said Dr. Rhodes made a pact with the devil that he could live forever as long as he would go to every single meeting of the 139 professional societies that he belonged to. <laughs> And I think he kept his part of the bargain, and it was the devil that reneged. <laughs> so these three that give the Rhodes Prize are three of his favorites. There were others, he, uh, and he was well honored, uh, honored, I suppose, as much as any American surgeon has ever been honored. Uh, he had 12 honorary fellowships from other countries, um, 10 honorary degrees from universities. Yale's was special. It was the only, the only honorary medical degree, I think, that Yale has ever given. And the citation, the uh, citation, I don't remember exactly, but it went something like this, that they thought he might be the clone of Benjamin Franklin. Well, I don't know about it, Yale. Maybe not, but I think Dr. Rhodes was as close as you can come. Thank you. Sorry, I'm back again for the last time. Um, so this year, we have the unprecedented honor of awarding the Rhodes Medal to two people. Um, Caitlin Carrico is a biochemist who specializes in RNA-mediated me mechanisms. She co-founded and was the CEO of Renard. Currently, she is senior vice president at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals. She's also an adjunct professor of neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania. The ultimate goal of Dr. Carrico's research has been in developing in vitro transcribed mRNA for protein therapy. She investigated RNA-mediated immune activation and co-discovered with Penn Medicine colleague Drew Weissman that nucleoside modifications suppress the immunogenicity of RNA, which has widened the therapeutic potential of mRNA in treating diseases. This led to the development of the two most effective vaccines for COVID-19, the BioNTech Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Their work holds vast promise for future treatments of many other diseases. Dr. Carrico was recently honored with the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Princess of Astorius Award, and the Vilcek Prize for Excellence in Biotechnology. She has received more than 110 international awards and honors for her pioneering and globally significant work in biochemistry. She continues to work on new therapeutic applications of mRNA therapy. The second awardee, Drew Weissman, is a world-renowned physician and researcher at Penn Medicine. 
best known for his contributions to RNA biology and the COVID-19 vaccines. He and co-collaborator Dr. Carrico invented the modified mRNA technology, again used in the Pfizer, Biotech, uh, and Biotech and Moderna vaccines to prevent COVID-19. He received his BA and MA from Brandeis University where he majored in biochemistry and enzymology. Dr. Weissman's graduate work focused on immunology and microbiology, earning his MD and PhD degrees at Boston University. Afterward, Dr. Weissman did a residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, followed by a fellowship at the NIH under the supervision of Anthony Fauci. Dr. Weissman is the named inventor on many patents. Two of these patents detail the modifications required to make RNA suitable for vaccines and other therapies. Later, these patents were licensed to CellScript, who subsequently licensed the technology to Moderna and BioNTech for their ultimate use in the COVID vaccines. The Weissman team is currently at work on a pan-coronavirus vaccine to stop the next coronavirus pandemic, a universal flu vaccine, and a vaccine to prevent herpes. They are working with Penn colleagues to develop cancer therapeutics with mRNA technology. Dr. Weissman's lab is also developing a SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine with the Chulong Korn University in Thailand to help residents of Thailand and other surrounding nations with fewer financial resources than the United States access life-saving vaccines. Each one of these recipients is going to address us. Um, I don't know if Dr. Carrico is here yet. Um, so Dr. Weissman, will you uh, come up to the podium and speak to us? Thank you. So Katie and I usually do this together, and she usually goes first, so we're a little out of order. Um, so I, I, I thank the, the American Philosophical Society for this wonderful award. Um, I, I always feel a little uncomfortable when I receive an award, and it's because what you have to understand about science, it's not what one or two people do. Science is an intuitive process that builds. So the work that Katie and I did, that we started 26 plus years ago, was built on the backs of many researchers before us. The researchers that identified mRNA as existing, as being present, and as being a potential therapeutic delivery system, followed up by the people who first injected RNA into an animal and first use mRNA in clinical trials in humans. So the, the work that we did moved that hurdle a little bit farther along. And it developed the RNA for the COVID-19 vaccines, but none of that would have happened without all of the prior researchers who did the work that built the, the, the foundation for what we did. My greatest hope is for the future for the people in the, uh, in the future, for our students and for their students who are gonna take this technology and develop it further and make hopefully fantastic new therapies, gene therapies, cancer therapies, therapies for many different diseases. And we'll take that further in the future to develop new approaches and new therapeutics that help mankind. Thank you very much. I have to say that I accepted several awards with two wise money. It never happened that I, last minute, I just arrived with the Uber, some <laughs> miscommunication. And, and so 
I, I am happy to be here. I was preparing for tonight to, to be here and talk to you about our work. And Drew already said what we have done together and uh, work for uh, decades. I myself, uh, I came from a small town in Hungary. 10,000 people live, lives there. And uh, I have a very humble background. My parents had only elementary school education, but uh, they were very uh, talented, but you know there were no opportunity for them to go to school. And uh, I was curious, as all of the child, and you know asking all of this question, why, why, why? And teachers responded, and um, uh, thanks to them, you know I learned more and more. And um, I am uh, very grateful to them, and of course my parents also. My father was a butcher, my mother was a bookkeeper, and, and uh, from them I learned that uh, hard work is part of life, and how to make sausage. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, so, and I had an older, older sister, you know, and that's how it happened. When your older siblings is good in school, they expect you to, to, to be good as well. I have to say that uh, in my life, I really did not, um, you know, I worked at the bench and I enjoy very much. And I didn't went to celebration. I got an award when I was in high school. And the next award, I get the Rosenstiel Award 2021 together with Drew, because I was not, you know, we were not celebrated and probably he mentioned about the difficulties we had. But um, I did went to celebration. I like to brag, so I mentioned my daughter is a two times Olympic champion in rowing for the United States Women A team. So, <laughs> so you know, we arrived from Hungary in 1985. My daughter was two years old at that time. And so she excelled, she attended Penn. And, and when colleagues introduced me at University of Pennsylvania, they usually said that, did, did you know? Kati's daughter is two times Olympic champion. <laughs> they never said that. Did you know Kati worked with mRNA? That was, <laughs> that was not the news for them. So, and uh, I used to go to those celebration and I was always introduced Susan mom. <laughs> but now that my daughter sometimes comes to some celebration with me and she's introduced as Kati's daughter. <laughs> so I am, I am really honored to be here and and uh, receiving the Rhodes Award. And uh, I, am, I am really humbled because uh, we drew, we received uh, uh, many awards. And uh, it's, it's, uh, every, every time, you know, that uh, uh, we were thinking about all of other scientists because, you know, today we are, we celebrate, you know, you, you celebrate us, but we know that all of those people who came before us, people who, whose work we relied on, and uh, they are not even with us anymore. And many people who, who work very hard uh, to develop the mRNA for therapy, we know, we know that uh, in the 90s, you know, uh, it was difficult for everybody to get funding and and in the 90s you know that like there was one one paper per year so it was easy to follow and uh, the field but many left and and so we did drew we you know persevered and we were you know because the science uh, let us uh, and and we followed that and and uh, i am very very grateful to be here and and uh, i am very appreciative. Thank, thank you very much.